want to talk about synchrony in nature today. Synchrony and why this is such a great principle for success until we humans step in. What did it to me initially was this great footage of salmon. No, not the orange slap and the freezer variety, the real thing. What I'm talking about are these breathtaking images of wild salmon chasing up some river in Alaska or Canada or the Pacific Northwest. Breathtaking. Thousands of bright red colored, densely packed bodies, all charging upstream and then waiting their turn to leap out and over some crazy waterfall. So stubborn, right? And then, of course, the bears. The bears are king, black bears, grizzly bears, whole families of them standing on these waterfalls, snatching, pawing the fish out of midair. Breathtaking. You've seen those pictures before, right? Now, at least to me, What's most striking about all of this is, is the synchrony with which the fish are making their way up the river. Perhaps you remember, salmon have a very particular lifestyle. They are born in the headwaters of some mountain stream, and from there, they descend slowly towards the ocean, and then, just like that, they switch from fresh water to salt water, and you could fill whole libraries with studies of biologists who try to figure out just exactly how they're able to do that. Then, they spent maybe two, three, five years in the ocean. To be honest, the food menu there is just that much better. Before hearing their call and then congregating in the mouths of the river again and chasing up their specific river where they were born. Then they spawn and die. Scientists call this anadromous. I just call it amazing. If you think about it, that mass migration makes a lot of sense. Almost all salmon species do it and what they call runs, each of those runs just lasts for a few weeks at a time. Different species, different timings, but each of those runs just a few weeks at a time. Millions of fish chasing up their specific river. And that must have some obvious advantages. So yes, it turns out that during some times of the year, it's best for the youngsters to survive, and it certainly doesn't hurt the, your diversity of your gene pool, if everybody is coming together and doing it at the same time, right? But the other big reason, and I'm getting back to Papa Grizzly here, is that these fish are facing a tremendous gauntlet of predators. Foxes, otters, eagles, and of course the bears, you name it. They are only waiting for these fish all along the Salmon River. <laughs> and of course, particularly further upstream, when the fish are already very weak, and uh, because they don't eat on their way up, and they're in very shallow water, they are really easy to catch. A single grizzly like that can eat up to 100 pounds of fish every day. It's a bonanza for everyone. Now, if you're like me, you might rightly wonder, isn't that a rather stupid idea of these fish to do that? To give yourself up that easily? The answer is no. What salmon are doing here is an age-old principle in nature called predator swamping. It used to work really well. Predator swamping is a simple concept. It means that instead of getting all fancy of defending yourself as an individual, like growing big spines or a big body size or getting all toxic or camouflaging yourself, no, your defense is in the numbers. It means like saying, sure, come, gobble up as much as you can, we don't care. It means that even if every single of your enemy is arriving at the scene and has its best day of its life, maxing out, gobbling up the max it can take, at some point, their feeding frenzy has to stop, simply because their bellies are full, and that's your chance to survive. You know what that reminds me of? Your typical Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> Late stage, when everybody kind of goes, oh, Grandpa, that apple pie, I'm sure it's delicious, but no, no more room. Now, if we look around, we see that this principle is really ubiquitous in nature. Plants like bamboo, they do it, they flower every decade or so, and then they synchronously produce all these seeds to overwhelm, swamp if you want, all those seed-eating predators out there. Or crickets, they emerge synchronously from the earth to swamp every cricket-eating predator out there. In essence, that whole concept seems to work because two basic rules apply. First, if you want to eat, 
you need to hunt. And second, bellies are the only form of storage allowed. And the beauty of this ingenious win-win arrangement of nature is that this way both the prey and the predator species get to survive. And in the meantime, a whole lot of energy is getting transferred constantly from the bottom of the food web up to the higher trophic levels. It's ingenious. And did you know, in the case of salmon, it's even better than that. It's not just the fish and the bears that profit. It's the entire forest ecosystem that benefits. That's because these millions of fish are either getting eaten or die and decompose somewhere. And they release a lot of nutrients. Nutrients that essentially came from the ocean, right? You could legitimately call salmon the terrific invention of nature for the ocean to travel up the mountains to fertilize the land. Anyway, predator swamping. Two rules. You want to eat, you need to hunt. And bellies are the only form of storage allowed. And that's the point where I want you to consider the one predator that we haven't talked about so far, us, humans. You see, the human predator is unlike anybody else out there. We just don't play by the rules. Sure, we have fished salmon and lift off of salmon, even built primitive societies around salmon for centuries. But only during the last one we have become truly capable of upsetting the fundamental principle that salmon is banking its survival on. See, how do we hunt for salmon these days? Easy. A few persanes here, a few gill nets there, some trawl nets here all strategically placed at the mouths of each river, there is now little doubt that we can indeed catch every single returning fish if we indeed want to. And best of all, thanks to technology and cheap fossil fuels, this incredible feat can be done by no more than a handful of people. Let's call them the actual hunters. Why would a few people choose to catch more fish in a day than they and their family can eat ever? Again, because technology allows us to freeze and then redistribute the bounty to all of us, the invisible hunters, who don't need to know or care when or where wild salmon run. We just love to eat them. Do you see the problem? The problem is that this fundamentally upsets the basic rules of predator swamping. Everybody who wants to eat needs to hunt? <laughs> yeah, right. Just, just imagine for the hell of it, all of us, the invisible hunters, being physically required to stand along a salmon stream. What a sight, right? Bellies are the only form of storage allowed? No chance. Picture a whole warehouse full of frozen fish, and you see why this runs completely afoul to the logic of predator swamping. So, we won, right? Through technology and sheer numbers, we are probably able to wipe every last wild salmon off the face of this planet, eat it, in fact, if we choose to. And the big reason why we are probably able to do that is salmon's age-old strategy of synchrony, of synchronous upstream migration. What a doozy. In essence, when faced with the modern human predator, Salmon's once so marvelous evolutionary strategy now appears like a fatally stupid idea. And yes, we could have pondered these things before, before actually succeeding in ridding many of North America's great salmon rivers completely from salmon. That's, by the way, very hard to change after the fact because these fish only go back to the place uh, where they were born. But of course we didn't. We just once upon a time declared these fish to be our resource, and then we attached some silly qualifiers to it like God-given or, or endless, all until realizing that either God has a very bad way of calculating endless, or all species, including us, are living on a finite planet with finite resources. I'm not saying there's no hope for salmon as we speak, there are a lot of intelligent salmon restoration and salmon conservation projects undergo, but the main point here remains. In modern human time, predator swamping is a doomed evolutionary strategy for salmon and all the other critters that we think of as our resource. That's because humans 
cannot be swamped anymore by no one. We broke the tenets of the rule. Therefore, now the fate of these fish rests on our conscious decision to let them survive. And that's the point. No longer we can hide behind willful ignorance here. We broke it, and now we own it. And that's the moment when you realize that you inevitably have become responsible, and there's no way back. I want to come back to that ultimate point, the inevitability of our become responsible, but let's just examine one more example real quick. Look, I admit it in all its geekiness, I'm a huge fan of horseshoe crabs. You know, these ancient-looking creatures that are actually a distant evolutionary offshoot of spiders? Not crabs at all. They fascinate me. These animals are 300 million years old, and they haven't changed much during all that time. They go like the dinosaurs. I remember the dinosaurs. Whatever happened to them? <laughs> you can say what you want, but when it comes to the whole survival of the species thing, horseshoe crabs rule. Incidentally, the way horseshoe crabs go about making another one of their generation, that's another nature spectacle. So in spring, during the nights of every full moon, they massively, synchronously rise from the ocean shelf to the beaches to spawn. Millions. Here, in Delaware Bay, it's one of the traditional hotspots of uh, horseshoe crab spawning. They lay these marbly greenish eggs that look a little bit like bullets. And these little bullets are true wonders of nutritiousness. And that's, of course, no secret to all the millions of shorebirds who make it a specific point to arrive for that protein feast. Here, this guy, a red knot, travels every year between South America and the Canadian Arctic. For them, it's literally like a power bar and Gatorade stand for a marathon runner. Crucial energy to complete the distance. These birds need to gorge themselves on these energy-rich eggs before they can even dare to continue on their strenuous voyage. And then there are, of course, your other thousands of sunderlings and plovers and turnstones, all of them gorging themselves on these protein, on that protein bonanza. And yes, again, now you could think again, is that, isn't that a really stupid idea of horseshoe crabs orchestrating a mud-spawning mud event on a mud flat as easily accessible to all these hungry, crawling shorebirds? No, by now you know the answer. What horseshoe crabs are doing here is good old predator swamping. They are producing such a large amount of eggs in such a short time that they can overwhelm all these predators and still have enough to survive and ensure the species, the survival of the species. And that's been benefiting the crabs and the birds and a whole host of other coastal critters, and it's been working for millions of years. Now, believe it or not, humans have joined the predators club too. Why? No, we don't eat horseshoe crabs, we don't even eat the eggs, but some cunning fellow found out that Rotting horseshoe crab carcasses make superior eel bait. Oh dear. <laughs> and the pharmaceutical companies, they want in on them too, because these animals contain a very special protein that you can use to detect bacterial contaminations. So again, humans just figured out a way to take advantage of their species age-old strategy. What happens in spring all over the eastern seaboard is that a few fishermen literally drive their pickup truck to the beach and chuck every single horseshoe crab that they can find on it. Easy. They can wipe out entire beaches in a night or two. The rest is a simple matter of storage and distribution, demand, and actually shrinking supply. The truth is, despite recent efforts, the numbers of horseshoe crabs have been falling precipitously, by some estimates over 80%. And that's, of course, bad for the crabs, but it's also bad for all those shorebirds, like the rat knot. Their numbers have been dwindling, too. Small wonder, right? So again, a species age-old strategy has been turned on its head because the human predators end up taking way too much. The human predator cannot be swamped anymore. So you might say, well, we, we definitely can't extinguish horseshoe crabs as a species. Perhaps not. But that's hardly the point here, isn't it? Doing what we are able to do, we certainly can reduce that species to a mere smidgen of its former role in the ecosystem. And that's an ecosystem, I promise you, 
we have no clue about, and chances are we don't like it much at all. So the conundrum applies in the modern age of, of the human man, of mankind. Predator swamping is a doomed evolutionary strategy, and uh, from now on, as with salmon, the fate of these fish now undeniably, and the horseshoe crabs, undeniably rests uh, on our conscious decision to let them live. In the end, I guess, the point I wanted to make today is a very simple philosophical one. The inevitability of us becoming responsible. Once you grasp that we have truly become a game-changing predator on Earth, there is no way back and then accept your responsibility and act. We broke it and now we own it. And you know what? The good thing is we have been there before. It's not that we don't know that with other bigger iconic species. Remember whales? We used to think of whales as a God-given endless resource, something to make lamp oil out of, of all things. We came around on that one, at least most nations did. Same thing goes for tigers and rhinos and elephants, although that latest news about uh, the upswing in elephant poaching is really shocking. But my point is that now the circle of our empathy has to widen once more and has to include all these smaller, less iconic species that now seem to depend as much on our conscious decision to let them survive. Species like salmon or horseshoe crabs, for example. To put this in the big picture, it's about a decade ago now that the famous uh, chemist Paul Crutzen baffled his audience in a conference and said, listen, the influence, the human footprint has become so all pervasive on Earth that it doesn't seem to be appropriate to call what the textbooks are saying we live in the Holocene. Instead, he proclaimed a new era has begun, the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is marked by the ubiquitous human alteration of our planet's climate, land, oceans, and all things living on or off it. When that happened, it's debatable, but I'm sure that one of the symptoms of the Anthropocene is the failing of an age-old strategy for species survival. And yes, I concede, this may not be, it is not the only and also, also not the most pressing concern that humans face in this rapidly changing and uncertain world, but my hope is that it's perhaps a powerful enough image to make us more acceptant of the inevitable our responsibility. Thank you.